listeners, and welcome to the NK News podcast recorded here in Seoul on the morning of October 10, 2022. And my in-studio guest today is Monica Macias, author of a book to be published next year in English for the first time about her unique experiences growing up in North Korea for 15 years as the foster daughter of Kim Il-sung. But please, before I begin, I want to remind everyone to leave a review about this podcast on iTunes or whatever platform you use and share this episode with colleagues and friends and even people you don't know because it's such a fascinating story. Uh, on Spotify, you can leave a rating but no reviews, but please do that anyway. And if you're listening on YouTube, please click like and subscribe. Secondly, check out nknews.org where you can find in-depth stories written by my journalist colleagues. Consider buying a subscription for a year that helps to fund the work that me and my colleagues do every day. Thirdly, you can follow NK News Org on Twitter uh, and myself at Jack OZ. Okay, well, let's start. Uh, Monica Masters, welcome on the show. Thank you for joining me, st- mo- joining me today and flying all the way from London for this podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So let's start, I guess, by telling our listeners who your late father was and what was his relationship with Kim Il-sung. So my father, my biological father, was uh, the first president of Equatorial Guinea, the independent country from Spain. And And let's say, for people who may not know, Equatorial Guinea is a small country on the west coast of uh, of Africa, the bulge of Africa. Yes, Mm. so it's between uh, Cameroon and Gabon. The tiny, tiny country is uh, where I come from, Equatorial Guinea, and it was former Spanish colony. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's still Spanish speaking today then? Yes, yeah. so the official language, the first one is Spanish and afterward it became the second one, the French. Ah. Yeah, but Spanish is the strong one because we've been colonized about 200 years. So it's very, right. very, very, the culture language is very inter- mixed mm-hmm. with Spain. Spanish. And, and your father had an unusual friendship with Kim Il-sung through their nationalist points in common, I suppose. Yes, because the colonial history they had and the nationalist. And, and also I would say my, my father was quite pragmatist. Mm-hmm. So, and when But he the, was not a communist. No, he wasn't. Because the relationship between uh, Spain and uh, the newborn country, which was Guinea, and where he was the head of the state, was really bad. So, uh, and at the same time, it was when China, Russia, mm-hmm. all this uh, communist bloc was reaching out to Africa. And so North Korean also was doing it and helped them when he, he the country was going through a very difficult moment in, in terms of economy, education, all, all this after the independence. So he sent us to study in North Korea. Mm, and that was in the late 1970s when you were about six years old. Yeah. And you went with your older brother and sister. So the mm. three of you together, originally with your mother, yes. all went to Pyongyang to live and study there. Yes. But after a few months, your mother returned to Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. And it was just you three children were there, left behind. Yes. Uh, going to the Mangyongde. Le- revolutionary boarding school. Revolutionary but my mom came... My mind came because she was sick. She had, um, I don't know what's the word in English, how you call it. She had the stone in... in she had a kidney stone? The kidney stone. Okay. So she came through the operation. Mm, uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the, so eventually there was there were three of you left there at the Mangyongde boarding school, the, uh, the school famous for um, raising up the next generation of revolutionary carters in North Korea. So how was that experience? It was uh, discipline, discipline, discipline. That's what the word uh, is. Uh, I would use to describe the the boarding school. It, it was quite disciplined because yeah. it was it was military uh, boarding school. So every day was uh, you needed to. It's nearly we were nearly treated as shoulder, soldiers. Uh, well, and you wore a uniform that yeah. looked quite military, didn't you? It was kind of like a, a military type uniform. Yes, it was. It was yeah, wearing the uniforms, which is which was different to other uniforms in uh, from other school. Did you learn to shoot a gun? Yes, I do. I did. Um, a, a real gun, or was it a like a, a wooden? We start replica. with a wooden okay. <laughs> replica, and yeah. then and then when we were ready, because all of of the students. Before graduating, they mm-hmm. have they have that practice 
right. in, in the camp during the summer where we... we oh, okay, so you yeah. slept outdoors, you yes, ate outdoors, exactly. you had a tent and you shot. Y- yes. Did, did you right. shoot any animals? No, it was no, not shooting animals. Just it was about targets, targets uh, practicing targets because we learn, we learn a military strategy ah. first and then we learn about the guns to understand how they work and then we needed a day, we needed to practice. So it was about not going out there and shooting animals. Yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not, it wasn't about that. It was more about sh- practicing and... Uh, Getting ready for war. I'm sorry? Getting ready for war. Um, Be- yeah, possi- ready, about, but, but, ready to defend be- North yeah, Korea Yeah, because they are soldiers. Mm. They become uh, military so soldiers. So, yeah. Right. So how many times did you meet Kim Il-sung in, in real life? And how would you describe his character and, and your relationship with him? My relationship with Kim Il Sung is, is uh, I would, I would describe it as a, uh, as a daughter and father who will look after the, someone who will look after the um, childrens of his friend mm-hmm. until he, uh, despite the friends died, yeah. he kept the promise to the friend and look after the children, and so it's my relationship is intimate. With him, mm-hmm. and I, I, I consider it something private that belongs to me. Yes. Yeah. Did you meet him many times? When we arrived first, yes. But then after that, when he sent us to the boarding school, it was more, yeah, uh, yeah, throughout the phone, and then. Okay. Now, uh, living uh, in North Korea as a as a non Korean. Yeah. Were were there special uh, limits or restrictions placed on on what you could do or could not do as a as a foreigner living in Korea? Yeah, there is a rules. They have their own rules. For instance, as a, as a foreigner, in order to if you want to go um, out there with a Korean, you need a permission. For instance, and uh, once you get the permission, you might you will go. For instance, visiting friends' houses or go there, but it need it's a bu- bureaucratic paperwork. You need a lot to do. Okay, so you were able to visit the home of your uh, schoolmates and see how they lived. Yes, I did. In fact, um, we did. My my brothers, my my with my brothers. Yeah, it was. I think it was eighty three, nineteen eighty three, and uh, we spent a new year. It was the second. Of January '93, uh, '83, I think. Eighties, mm-hmm. I would be. I'm, I don't remember, but it was eighties, and we spent the, the the day visiting them in the house, and yeah. Did you have to get a special permission every time that you visited somebody, or was it just you had a permission for visiting one house and you could go there any time? Well, it's it's kind of. I wouldn't say it in a every time. It's just you need to. You need to understand how the rules was. You need to build a relationship, and if you know the people, right people, who you talk to, and how you get there, then it was easier. You didn't need to all the time going through all that paperwork because they already know you. They already so it wasn't going every time going to do all the same steps. But that's because it uh, is easier because they know us. Mm-hmm. Did did you like Korean food initially? No, I didn't. I didn't like it. I actually grew up only eating um, the sweet sweet um, bun mm-hmm. with the red bean paste. Red inside. bean paste inside. Yeah. yeah, that was my food. But no, I I I didn't like the smell of Korean food. I really didn't like it. But but then once I left um, Pyongyang mm-hmm. when I arrived in in Madrid. I started to eat in Korean food because I was missing my friends, right. the place I grew up, and the smell where I grew up. I was missing it so much. And then suddenly I just started to eating all the, except kimchi. Mm-hmm. I, still, I still don't eat kimchi. Ah. But, yes. But, um, um, yeah, everything else, I, I, I enjoy it. And so after the, I like uh, it. After the Mangyong Day School, you went to university uh, in North Korea. Yes. And what did you study there? I studied, uh, so I'm trained as a um, uh, textile engineer and then also a fashion designer. Okay. And, and how did you choose that? How did that happen? 
Um, well, actually, it wasn't my choice because I wanted to become a pianist. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. But then Kim Il-sung said that I needed to study something that is, is uh, useful for Equatorial Guinea when I go back to Guinea. Yeah. I needed to create a job for the people, mm-hmm. help the people, and yeah, knowing, uh, learning, knowing how to do clothing for the people, I could, I could help the country. Right. So after you, if I remember rightly, because it's been a couple of years since I read your book, but I think after you graduated university, mm-hmm. Kim Il-sung gave you a choice, either stay and live and work in North Korea yeah. or go out into the wider world. Yeah. And you chose the latter. Yeah. And you left North Korea in July 1994, just a few days or a couple of weeks before Kim Il-sung died. Not a couple of weeks, a couple of months. couple of be, months. Yeah, I left in April ah. and he passed away um, in July. In July. So how different would your life have been if you had stayed in Pyongyang? Did you, do you ever think about that sometimes? Well, that's a good question. I never thought about it. But uh, now, yeah, I think it would have been completely different. But um, I'm not sure because I, I, I need to leave it. But I don't, I don't know. I need to leave it. But I never thought about that because I was more into, into my identity crisis. Mm. That's overwhelmingly dominate my thoughts in finding out who am I, where I come from, my root, right. who, who, who was my father. All this question was yeah. overwhelmingly dominating my, my, my thoughts. So I never thought about staying there and then leaving. So I never really mm. actually thought, have thought about that. And you went to, uh, to Spain initially because yes, yes. Uh, you, you have a, a Spanish grandfather. Yes. Uh, and you went there to, to explore your roots. But when you were in Spain, you heard that, that Kim Il-sung died. And, and how did that news affect you? It was, I was sad. I was sad because for me, it, he, he was there to look after for us when my father was killed. And he kept his promise to my father that he would look after us. Yeah. And he kept that. So I'm grateful for that. I will be always. So, and also I want to make sure this, when we're talking about the politician, we always need to make about whether we are talking about politician or the human being. Mm -hmm. They are two different things in every country, any politician. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about Kim Il-sung as a father, not a politician. So I will be always grateful because if I'm here, sitting here in Seoul, speaking to you Mm -hmm. and then... It's because thanks to him, I would, I don't know what would have happened to me if we were sent back to Guinea back then. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yes, I would be grateful. So when he passed away, it was from that perspective as a as human. Yeah. I felt very sad. Yeah. And now, um, going back to your time in Pyongyang, as we said before, you were there uh, without parents, but with a brother and sister. Did they, when did they leave? Uh, did they leave before you? Yeah, they they left before me. So my brother left uh, first when he graduates from from his college. He went back to back, Guinea. Back to Guinea. Back to Guinea. Ah. Yes, and where he is staying now. And then my sister stayed longer because her career was longer than everyone else, which is in medicine. Um, uh, it takes a long time to lo- prepare. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. longest career. I think it's uh, in every country. It's the longest one, the medicine one, because yeah. they they go through university and the practice, and then master degree again, and practice in the hospital. So it was quite long career. Long long course of study. Course of study. And and so she actually qualified as a North Korean doctor in North Korea. Yes, right. she is. Uh, and then, but master degree she did it in China. So uh, yeah. How do they look back on... Because you're the only one who's written a book about your experiences in, in North Korea, right? Yes. So how do they look back on their time uh, in Pyongyang? Do you, do you have similar feelings or because you came, went at different ages, do you think about it a bit differently? It's different. It's completely different to, to me. They are more... Um, because they were older than me, mm. I think they had this space of Guinean and Spanish culture already inside them. Yeah. And then they we they were becoming adopting the new culture which was Korean. So it's not that 
profound to them, right. like like in me, yeah. where I grew up. Actually, it was I was six years old. Yeah. It was when you know you start to learn. So, Who you are, and, yeah, and, and in fact, you lost your Spanish language ability, didn't yes, you? Yeah, yes, you, yes. F- for you, it was almost like going to North Korea. You were like a tabula rasa. You were, you know, going back to to square one, back to nothing, and yes. building up from there exactly. as a Korean. Exactly. So internally, you felt like a Korean, mm. thought like a Korean, spoke like a Korean, and and th- so this process of you going to Spain after university was you finding out about that part before Korea. Exactly. That was the path. And, and so who are you today, Monica? <laughs> today? Oh, my God, that's a good question. I know who I am. I know where I'm from now. I discovered I did. So I spent my life, my adult life, half of my adult life, looking for my roots, investigating, researching about my father and everything. And now I know where I'm from. And to your question, who, mm. who I am, I would say I am... Well, I don't, if I'm honest to you, I don't have this feeling of attachment to a country. Like, I do not have that. But I think I can be, my passport obviously says Guinean and Spanish because I have dual. Ah. Uh, but in terms of feeling, I I feel as a Korean because it's where I grew up. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, I am able to live in these countries now which is related to my background my root which is spain and equatorial guinea and also i feel good in living in london in anywhere i'm actually yeah you're comfortable anywhere yeah i'm comfortable anywhere why london why did you go there oh london i i went to london to pursuing a master degree in international relations and um and diplomacy Mm -hmm. so i did that master degree there that was the reason why I I, I went there after uh, living in so many contrasting societies like right. North Korea and then United States in New York and then South Korea and then in Guinea so I had these cultures and then I also wanted to understand about my father why there was such uh, contrasting and um, single narrative there going on about him, what happened. So I wanted, after doing my own research, I wanted to put those experience and what I have discovered in a in an academic perspective to understand it more. And I wanted to put it in an uh, academic perspective. So I went to London and, and I did a master's degree in, at SOAS. That's the uh, School of African and Ori- uh, Oriental, Oriental and African Studies. Oriental Studies, yes. I always get them mixed up there. So, <laughs> but you've lived now in, in both Koreas. You've lived in North Korea. You've lived uh, several years as an adult uh, yes. in South Korea. Yes. Um, now you are back for the first time visiting after many years. How would you compare the experience of living in both Koreas? How similar or how different are the two Koreas? The first thing, let's, let's go to the different thing, different Difference, what I see from my perspective is the economic, it's very obvious now. Uh, Although I I want to uh, point out that in 60s and 50s, North Korea was in better position economically than South. That's if you, if anyone, anyone who is interested in in the the Korean uh, history Mm -hmm. will find that out. But then from 80s onward, South Korea obviously grew up and picked up. And so economy is the huge difference there. But the um, similarity is the culture. It's very similar culture. Oh, not similar. It's the, it, it, for me, it's the same culture. What are the aspects of that culture? What, what specific mm. things are there that are the same? Uh, the mindset. A lot of the mindset, a lot of because both sides are based very much on the uh, Confucianism, and both society are collective societies, and an individual in everyday life, the demeanor, the people is exactly the same. And just to give you an example, when I'm in, interacting with a South Korean. In, in the beginning, they have this barrier thinking that, oh, yeah, I'm a foreigner. But then when I sp- 
start speaking with them, that barrier just collapsed. And the same thing that happened in North Korea as well, that barrier collapsed. And they say, oh, I feel like I'm speaking to to our people because mm. they have this ex- expression of our people, whether mm-hmm. it's North or South, they always say it's our people. In other words, English will be like, they feel like speaking to the uh, to a Korean, mm-hmm. and I, I go and I ask them, why do you think you feel that way? Because we, we, we have the same culture, similar mindset, how we do, we think. So obviously there is a difference of, because South Korea has, um, has been inf- uh, strongly influenced by Western cultures coming in, obviously there is, but there is a still very strong way of 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 seeing the war which is very much based on the um confusion mindset of seeing the war the uh the north korean government sometimes criticizes south korea because these days a lot of uh for example south korean farmers are marrying women from other countries because they're having difficulty finding south korean brides and so mm-hmm. we have uh, biracial children in korea and north koreans sometimes criticizes south korean for Diluting the bloodline of Koreans and 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 um, putting how do they say putting one even one drop of ink in the Han River is is, is too much it it spoils the uh, the color of the water and I'm just wondering in what ways did you uh, experience North Korean views on on race and ethnicity while you were growing up there? So you mean while I grew there, experiencing the yeah, mixing col- with them? No, no, what I mean is, I guess, because culturally, internally, you, mm. you, you are, you know, uh, felt fully Korean living in North Korea, but mm-hmm. physically, you know, you don't look Korean. Yeah. Uh, and did, wa- was there a sense, did you have a sense that if you chose to stay in North Korea, you could have been welcomed as a North Korean, or did you yeah. always feel that there was a... No, a, no, no, uh, no, no, that's what I mean. That's, that's again, link back to what I just said, that the barrier disappear once we start into... Uh, Talking together with together, so together. What I mean by if I start uh, speaking with a Korean and then we interact, mm-hmm. we build a relationship. That barrier of that is foreigner collapse immediately, and I have felt that in whether it's north in south immediately. That's why I always think that it's all about building relationship with one person. Uh, once it's like when you are. Let's say you're falling in love with someone who is not really attractive in the in the in the beginning. You don't uh, physically maybe it's not attractive to you, but you start talking over that person that you forgot. Oh, it's not that attractive. And that, uh, on the contrary, um, once you know that person talking, you feel attractive, not the physical. Mm-hmm. So the physical, uh, what you see, really, really is not that much. It's I think it's the prejudice we had in mind until we really confront our prejudice by knowing each other and interacting together. And then that prejudice just, boom, disappeared it's, it, it, from my experience. You, you had an interesting story that you wrote about in your book in the, in the Korean uh, edition. I, I should explain to our readers. So in 2013, your uh, Korean book came out, Nanan Pyongyang e Monikaim Nida, which is the basis for what will become the English language book to come out next year. Mm-hmm. And in that book, you, you talk about one time when uh, a North Korean official actually thought you were Korean. Yes. Could you tell that story? It's an interesting story. <laughs> so actually, he, he, it was on, on Saturday. So the Saturdays we used to go to with friends to um, a, a kind of club where all foreigner meets to spend uh, the, the weekends on a Saturday night. Mm-hmm. So I was going there with a, a Syrian friend and we parked. So it's, it's in that, that club is in the hotel. We parked in the, in the, in the parking, the car. Mm-hmm. As, as I get off the, um, the car, I noticed that uh, someone behind me talking to me in Korean and, um, and questioning why, it was, why I was with them. Um, foreigners and I said because I'm foreigner <laughs> I, I'm not Korean and he said well you speak like a Korean you can't uh, uh, foreigners don't speak like you they all have an accent and you don't have accent you are Korean and I said no I am not Korean and well we had this 
discussion going on. He's saying yes, and I'm saying no. And he eventually um, wanted to take me to the police station. And, oh. I, sa- and I, I said, I am not going anywhere because I'm not breaking the rule. And he said, yes, you are breaking the rule because you know that we native Korean, we cannot, uh, without permission, mixing with the foreigners. And I said, no, no, no. But in the end, um, I, I asked my Syrian friend to go into the hotel where the concierge was mm-hmm. and ask him to come and talk to, to the, uh, the, the person to explain him. And they, they spoke and he explained him and then they, he let me go. But it was quite surreal and uh, unbelievable and surreal because obviously um, my aspect, I, lo- I do look like a foreigner. Yeah. But because, just because my ability to speak just like them, yep. made me think that I was Korean somehow. <laughs> did Did you ever know any Korean who wanted to to mix with the foreigners to go to the club, for example, and 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 have a party on a Saturday night? Um, no, because they all know it's not allowed. Mm. But yeah. do, do you know why that rule exists? I don't know. That's the rule of the country. That's the their rule. Uh, do you still have contact with people in North Korea now? No. So you're, it's, you're, it's been a long, long time since I left. So yeah. y- your school friends, you're not in uh, writing letters to them or anything? No, okay. no. Have you ever tried writing a letter to Kim Jong-un, for example? Um, no, I, I haven't. Do you think you'll visit North Korea again in the near future when Pyongyang opens up to foreign visitors again? Yeah, I would like to. It's the place I grew up. It's my city. It's the city I grew up. Would you not like to visit your, your, your city? Sure, I would. Yes. So, <laughs> would you would you go? But would you go there just as a visitor, or would you try and do some work there, or establish uh, some kind of bridge between Korea and the outside world? Well, I never thought about that, but uh, I don't know. Well, I'm I just wondering because you, you've studied the uh, masters in international relations and diplomacy now. And do oh. Have, do you have some thoughts about how you might use that uh, in relation to your experience in North Korea? If I'm honest with you, the reason I I started master degree wasn't wasn't to looking for a job initially wasn't mm-hmm. wasn't looking for a job in that field. I did that the the master degree in order to understand me uh-huh. in order to understand where I come from because I was born in a polit politician political family and yep. raised by a politician and then. All my background was politic and then African politics, European and then Korean. So, and I wanted to understand why such different narrative about my father, uh, why some saying this, why some say this. I wanted to understand in order to, to understand it. And from the poly- academic perspective, I wanted to see it, what I researched my well, the, the result of my research, I wanted to prove it to myself rather than to others uh, uh, in an academic perspective. Yep. That was my goal. It wasn't, it wasn't to go out there and look for the job in a... It wasn't, but I, I mean, if one day, <laughs> I think I could help. But the main goal wasn't about that, was rather understanding about my gra- grand um, background. And did you achieve that goal? Yes, definitely. So, so now, um, do you think that there's some way that you, with your unique background and experience, can do something good for the people of North Korea? Um, North Korea and Guinea and Spain and everyone who wants, okay. and South Korea as well. I don't limit, like I said before, um, no, before now, before the this interview, in a, one of others' interview, I'm I'm inclusive. I'm open to everyone, not only North Korea or South Korea. Okay. Everyone, everywhere that needs helps, or oh, or if I could help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're still exploring that, still looking into what you might do. Um, do you have any plans? Not yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What what have you learned from your time in North Korea and your studies after leaving North Korea that you think the world must know? Um, I would say what I would say is is that not everything that we listen, we read is is what is it? What is it? And if we really want to understand, 
I'm I'm talking from my experience. Yes. Yeah? Everyone else can take my advice or not. It's it's fine, perfectly, and we all have our different opinion, and that's that's really fine. But from my perspective, what I learned, and I'm sharing with them, and I I'm not dictating what they have to do, is that when we we might need to analyze things and then do research, just not to rely on the one single perspective, one single narrative, because it doesn't show you the whole picture. And also de- uh, it depends who is telling you, what is telling you, why is telling you, and then need to understand the power relation in order to see all the whole picture. So I would, I would say if I am, that's what I learned from my experience. So I don't take, when, when I am reading a book, mm-hmm. I'm quite analyzing it. I read it analyzing. And then when I am listening to the mainstream media, I'm listening to them, I am analyzing it, and I do my own research in order to see the big picture, not only the single narrative that they, they want me to learn about. Because there is more about it behind, always, in every story. And I learned that in, in, from my own father's stories. And uh, yeah, so if any, anyone thinks that it could be serving as advice, okay, take it. If you think it's not, don't take it. It's, it's just sharing my experience. Is there a, a good book that you would recommend? I mean, obviously apart from your own book that you've written. <laughs> but is there another good book that you would recommend that where people can learn about North Korea in general? About North Korea? Well, I am, right now, I don't know. I rather, recent, I am, I'm reading more books about, um, after uh, the, the master degree, I'm reading books about international relation, all those things, but about North Korea right now, mm-hmm. I don't know, I'm not, I haven't been in very much following North Korean, how you say, issues right. going on. So I'm honestly, I don't know which book I, I would uh, recommend. I don't know. Okay. Uh, let, let's go back to, uh, to 1989. Mm-hmm. You're in North Korea. You are, let me see, 27 years old. No, 17 years old, mm-hmm. 1989. And uh, this is around the time of uh, the students uprising in, uh, in China in Tiananmen Square. Mm-hmm. And, and something happens that makes you question what you've been taught to believe in North Korea. Mm-hmm. There was some little incident. What, could you tell us what happened there? So I decided to go to, it was, so like you said, it was 1989. In August, I decided to travel to China, to Beijing. Just I wanted to see the, another country yep. and, and experience it by myself. So I decided to go and uh, I took the train and after 24 hours by train, I, uh, I was in, in, in Beijing and I was in shock and um, looking around, wandering around, everything was new, mm. so many people and I, uh, and, and I just stopped. I, I saw on the advertising of uh, mascara and the picture was advertising it. It was really beautiful. And then I, it, it took my, my breath away. And I just look at it. I spent like 10 minutes looking at it because it was such a wonderful idea. Never seen in, in Pyongyang. Yeah. And kind of really good idea promoting a product, I thought. Yeah. And after that, after 10 minutes there, and then I said, oh, my God, it's time to go to the embassy where... My cousin was uh, expecting me, and I tried to stop people asking the way, mm. but obviously I didn't speak Chinese, and they didn't understand me, Korean or English, and it was it was becoming <sighs> demoralizing. Yeah, and and suddenly I saw a guy, white guy, with a tall, with a back, big backpack came into my view and I said, oh, my, he must speak English. And I approached him and I asked him, do you speak English? And he said, yes, I do. And I asked him, do you happen to know how to get this 
address and he mm-hmm. said, oh, you're lucky. And as he started speaking, I realized he was American. Ah. And my body just reacted. I was in panic mode. Yeah. And I couldn't, I just frozen. I didn't know how to react. And then sweating my hands. And I start to walk back. And he was approaching me. He, and he, he catched my hand. Oh, he said, oh my God, your hands are so cold. And I snatched away my hands and leave me alone. Oh. And I just run away. And run away. And I catch the, um, the taxi to the embassy. And when I arrived to the embassy, I, and I explained that to, to my cousin what happened. And he started laughing and he said, oh, you can, you can feel that way because you grew up in Korea. And I, uh, and I was, why? What was that supposed to mean? Mm. What, 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 what do you mean by you feel that way because you grew up in And I said, you need to open your mind. And then he took me to, to City 2 in Beijing. And then it was, it was, for me, it was a very important moment in my life because it was triggering me. Yeah. Yep. To think different way, to, to see different perspective. So yeah, that's what happened. And so you you had this this moment, this this kind of um, I guess you could say the outside world interfered with your world, and and you had to choose: do I keep believing what I was taught, or do I look broad, more broadly and think of something different? Do you think that that North Korean people should have a moment like that too? Well, if I'm honest, if they should have it, but it's depend. It's depend of 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 what do you. So exactly, when you saying they should have that moment, what you're trying to achieve? What are you trying to make a change? Are you trying to change them? Are you? What do you? No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we change them because mm. remember, your the way you told the story was mm. that. You changed yourself, mm-hmm. but you had an op- th- that moment gave you an opportunity, mm-hmm. and then you went and you explored and you did some more reading and you mm-hmm. did some more traveling and yeah. you, you changed yourself. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess that you know North Korean society is quite disciplined. There, yeah. are, there are rules. It's quite strict. Yeah. And so some people in North Korea who may not even have an idea that mm. there is something out there, yeah. they don't have these moments of opportunity because. Yeah. They don't, you know, not, they don't meet that American they man on the street int- in Beijing. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is, is, is there a way that we can provide North Korean people with a moment where they can say, well, that's interesting, but I'm going to keep going this way, and that's their choice. Or they can say, wow, there's something else out there in the world. I want to know more about that. Mm-hmm. And that's also their choice. Um, I think it's up to them. It's, a everyone, it's up to everyone's mindset. Everyone, no, everyone, how do you, do you think? And also is for me, it's a combination of of many things because before that happened, that uh, that incident, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, beho- beho- that would happen with American, yep. I was quite uh, stubborn. I'm very stubborn, and uh, unless I'm not convinced that this, if you tell me that this color is black color, I wouldn't believe it until I see it myself. Mm-hmm. I was kind of that person. I always has been, I'm very stubborn until I see myself. I wouldn't believe that. But then at the same time, I'm very, um, I was very, um, once I convinced, I obey because I believe that's the correct way to see it. Mm-hmm. So if you, you look at, since I grew up in North Korea with this education, and I was convinced this is the way to be. Yeah. So I was convinced uh, through Six six years old until when this happened was I was seventeen mm-hmm. or yeah uh, adolescent. So imagine people, many people live like that. That's believing that what they have taught since the kindergarten that goes can go the long time of beliefs, mm. and that change unless you want to change, you really. I don't think really someone can change others. No. Yeah. Because unless you really want to change, you can, for instance, Lino, my cousin, could mm-hmm. have told me that, oh, because you grew up there. And I could have said, so what? I'm not changing. I could have not, I could have just stay and not changing. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to say is depend, uh, if that person is, um, how they digest what they think in, 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 uh, and also education, I think is, is very 
one of the factors could be, and curiosity could be the factor, and prejudice could be the factor, because I have seen these kind of things that people, you can tell them whatever, and they don't change. So I think it's quite individual. So when you say you, what you need to do to give North Korean, to give those choice or not, it's depend on them. For me, it's depend on them, not to you. It's not up to you. It's up to them. Make sense what I'm, what I'm saying to you? Do you understand me, what I'm trying to say? Because it was up to me when I changed. Not because actually my cousin told me that. My co- what my cousin told me then would, yeah, might have me triggered to think, but the change was me. He could have, let's say, yeah, it triggers with this question, but if I don't want to change, I'm not changing because I'm not convinced. Yeah, your, your response to that stimulus mm-hmm. is, is your choice. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that mm-hmm. uh, mm. sometimes we don't know until there is a stimulus, mm-hmm. we don't know what we uh, you know what other possibilities are out there you know um, if you hadn't met that American man if you had met a British man on the street for mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. you might have gone back happily to uh, to Pyongyang and said I didn't meet any Americans I feel safe the world is mm-hmm. okay and yeah. then you would have been unchanged yes uh, so that that stimulus gave you that opportunity to to react one way or the other and uh, there are people uh, who mm. you know uh, there are for example defectors who come out of North Korea mm-hmm. refugees from North Korea who live in other countries including South Korea and they want to give that kind of trigger, that kind of stimulus to their relatives and friends back in North Korea. And they have succeeded? Have they succeeded? Uh, What? Giving that uh, stimulation, you say, have they succeeded and have they done it? Uh, On a small scale, yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Uh, So when one family member comes and follows another family member out or... um, Mm -hmm. uh, Because I know cases who are going back to North Korea, a lot of cases, and many people don't speak up about that. Can you talk more about that? What do you mean? There was in, uh, in my book, in, in English version, there is actually about that case, the lady who wants to go back. Mm-hmm. And she was in feeling like in the middle between South Korea and North Korea. So she came to South Korea because of the treatment, medical treatment. So yep. she actually is from the very north side of North Korea with the border of China. So she went to uh, China. I forgot her name right now. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But if you Google, some, uh, Google, she was in, in, a, in an old newspaper, many newspapers, it was an issue. Yeah. So she wanted, she, she actually, she began, she going back to, uh, going to China because of the treatment. And then these brokers from China mm-hmm. who sent people to South Korea, they sent her here. And she find in a situation, very difficult situation to survive mm. here. Mm-hmm. And her daughter is in, it's in, I think it's in Pyongyang. Right. Or, I don't know, not in Pyongyang. I don't know, but mm-hmm. it's in North Korea. Yeah. And they cannot meet. Mm-hmm. And she has been climbing to, to, to send her back to North Korea. And there is another cases I came across. But many people don't talk about that because once you, it's, 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 there is like in the middle of nowhere, nor, nor in South, nor in accepted in, in North, so but they want to go back. So there are, there are cases. So I think it depends. So it's not only coming back here, but those who have come there also, they are who wants to go back. So how do you explain that? Because they come, all, so they came out because of the stimulation you are talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then they said, I want to go back now. Mm-hmm. What kind of the stimulation is that then? So well, that's what I'm saying, that I think it depends on the mindset of the people and how you see how it uh, then. So, so should we not give them any stimulus or outside information? No, is, is it's not about, I'm not saying you give or not give. It's up to, up, up to them. Mm-hmm. It's not up to you or up to me. No, the respo- that's what I said, that the response is up to them. Yeah. Right, uh, mm-hmm. whether you choose to stay or go, or or go and then come back, that's mm-hmm. a that's mm-hmm. a response that a, any individual can make. But uh, the providing of the outside information, that's. But I think that so uh, depends on the authority of the country, ah. because it's a collective society mm-hmm. where the power is up to down, top to top down, down yeah. top down rather than down top, uh, bottom up. But uh, bottom up, okay, sorry. So the North Korean government doesn't like other people, to, uh, outside groups, to send information. So therefore, what we shouldn't do it. 
We no. should respect the law of uh, of North Korea to not give them Engage. South Korean dramas or uh, or TV shows or music. That's not up to me. Is it up to me? No, I'm, I'm asking you because you, yeah, you no, said but that, that North Korea has a law. It's up to the laws of that country. So I'm, yeah. so I'm asking. So if since that is the law of North Korea, the law is yeah. Um, Nobody should look at South Korean dramas or American TV shows or listen yeah. to foreign music. Mm-hmm. So um, should we respect that law? Is, is not a sovereign country? Should I intervene in a sovereign country to say what they should do? When I, st- when I study international law, the other countries, you, know, you do not intervene. In fact, Westphalian Agreement mm-hmm. was born out of that, not intervening a sovereignty country affairs. Should I intervene? to tell them to change the law? Do I have that power? I'm asking myself. Mm -hmm. And I think no. But what's intervening? Is writing a letter intervening? Is sending a CD-ROM intervening? Is uh, sent listening to a radio broadcast is that intervening? What what's in, how do we define it? In, in the Treaty of Westphalia, mm-hmm. which, if I recall, was back in the 1600s, yeah. there was no radio, there was no internet, there mm-hmm. was no USB discs, there was no CD-ROM. So these things are obviously not included in in the Treaty of Westphalia. So how do we? Uh, do but we is, is, it, it is in a modern society is it is not intervening in a modern society we love we leave because we from Westphalian Agreement that era mm-hmm. we have. A, there has been evolution. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the tools are different of using it. It can be direct one. It can be diffusive and very many different ways adaptive to the modern society. But right, still, but is, is, is intervention is up to me, a Guinean, or is up to a Korean? Well, In my way, is is up to Korean. Uh, but that's a good question because yeah. under the law of both Koreas, mm. it's illegal for Koreans on both sides of the border to have contact. So, for yeah. example, let's say that I'm a Korean Kim Chol Su, yeah. and I have an uncle in in Pyongyang, and yeah. his name is Kim Han Su. Yeah, it's illegal for me to write to him or call him. Yeah, uh, both in South Korea and in North Korea. Mm-hmm. So, if I call him, mm-hmm. I could go to jail in South Korea. Yeah, if he calls me, he could go to jail in North, in North Korea. Korea. Yeah. Now, is that something that's in the Treaty of Westphalia that we should say, well, you know, the government says there should be no people-to-people contact, therefore we must respect it. Is that but intervening in state affairs or is that the state intervening in human-to-human contact? I think it's, it's the state in... in, in no, the quest, can you make the question again? So, so is that intervening in the affairs of a sovereign nation or is that... Rather, the, the writing the letter between Koreans, calling Koreans, writing to Koreans, sending. If I am bo- Korean, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. but I, in this case, you are asking a foreigner. That's the, the why I'm saying about huh. the intervention because I'm foreigner. I'm Spanish. I'm Guinean. I'm not Korean. Well, but no. I gr- grew up. Mm-hmm. But if I was Korean, then I I would obviously it's my family. I would like to uh, write to my family, someone who lives in North mm-hmm. or South, let's say, and then it's up to the both governments sit together like adult and negotiate for the for the best benefit of the, their citizen. So at the moment, that's the two that's governments. what that's what I pursue. Mm. But when you're asking me, uh, uh, should should they do this as a foreigner? And I'm saying it's up to Korean. That's my answer. Okay. As a Korean. But if I were Korean, let's say, mm-hmm. I am Korean by blood or by passport, mm-hmm. then I would demand for the government to sit down to negotiate for the benefit of us, of those people who are suffering. Make sense? That for me is different. As a foreigner, I respect. Of course, I would wish because I grew up in Korea. I have friends. It's very sad to see them family separated. I would wish that I really wish, and uh, the unification. I'm pro unification of this country. I am profoundly for that. But I'm also I'm aware that I'm not politician in this country, and I make my my line there. Mm-hmm. I respect that. It's good or bad. It's up to Korean. I think that's very clear. Yeah, yeah, that's very clear. Uh, Koreans on both sides, right? So, uh, so if if North Koreans come to South Korea and they want to communicate with their families, you don't have any problem with that because they're Koreans talking to Koreans. The family, right? Same root, but if same the, culture. But if the government says don't don't talk to your family, but again, that's that's what do you what do you want me to do as a foreigner there? 
Well, I'm not. I'm not asking you to do yeah. anything as a foreigner, but but I'm going back to you saying that uh, that Korea is a top down society. It's yeah, not bottom up. Yeah. But but sometimes people do want to do things that are uh, mm. opposed to the government, such as talk to their family members and. Mm-hmm. But that that's okay because that's Koreans talking to Koreans, right? I'm d- I don't know if that's okay or not. I I'm it's not up to me to judge is okay or wrong or right. I'm not a judge. As what it is, mm. as what I see that it is. Now, you ask me about Spain as Spanish citizen. You ask me ab- about Guinea as Guinea p- uh, citizen. I have a, a say in those country because I'm citizen. Right. But. When it comes to Korea, obviously I am culturally attached mm-hmm. because it's where I grew up. But I'm not getting into the politic in this country because I'm not a citizen here. When you uh, published your book in 2013, what, what kind of response did you get from Korean readers? How did Koreans respond to your book? Oh, I was surprised by the, uh, the uh, reaction because I was when, when I decided to publish the Korean version, I thought... It would be it wouldn't be accepted first of all, and secondly, even if accepted, people wouldn't like it. But it was all the, the contrary. People like that, mm-hmm. and then many people was um, writing me, and I mean, and not writing me directly, but leaving the uh, comment on the comment section in YouTube, whether ah. it's in YouTube, whether it's in in. Um, after the interview, BBC interviews and others' interviews, they were saying, oh, thank you for being so honest. Um, thank you for, for letting us know, learning of, about other side, yeah. other side, the other side of, of our, our country. And one was saying, I realize we are one. We really, we have one culture. We are the same. And one, all those kind of positive um, comments. Did you get any comments directly or indirectly from North Koreans? No, no. Oh, yes, one, one of them. I had one of them, but it was in indirectly from my brother. Ah. Yes, who who said uh, she's quite honest in the book. Mm. Uh, yeah. You mean the, a, a North the, Korean reader read it and said you're quite honest? Yeah, he said uh, she's quite honest in her opinion, and and balanced. Which what I was trying to, which what I was trying to achieve, and I and I just said things as it is. And when will your book come out in English? Uh, it will come up on tenth of March in two thousand twenty twenty three. Right. Yes. And who's the publisher? Uh, it's Duckworth. Duckworth. And what's the English title going to be? The Korean title is Manan Pyongyang and Monica Imnida. What's the English title? Black Girl f- from Pyongyang. Black Girl from Pyongyang. Okay. Yes. And it's, uh, there are obviously a lot of things from the Korean book will be in the English book, but there's also some more things that you've written yes. since then. Yeah, yeah since then, because it's, there are more um, reflection on mm. the uh, what happened. And it's kind of, I'm, and also harnessing the, 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 the result of my research right. and everything, what I learned, and then a uh, master degree at SOAS so in so London. So it's more, it's rich in more det- in details than the Korean version. Now, a, a last question for you, a little bit uh, unusual. Are you on Twitter? Do you use Twitter? No, I am, I am old fashioned, but I would like to. I want to, yeah, op- open an account. Because there is somebody on Twitter yes. with the name, the Twitter username Masias Ngema, yeah. who has both an English account and a Korean language Twitter account. Two accounts, one in English, one in Korean, who claims to be an Equator, Equator-Guinean fan of the DPRK and Juche. Uh, oh. And he used the profile picture is a badge of your late father. Oh. Have, are you uh, aware of this Twitter account? Could it be a <laughs> relative or, or someone who. who I have no idea. Oh. What was the what's the name again? Um, Matthias Ngema. Yeah, Matthias Ngema. Yeah, that's Mathias right. Matthias Ngema is my father's name. But, well, that's what the that's the name they're using on Twitter. Whoa! Uh, and and your father's face. It's it's unusual. That's uh, unusual and yeah. and really a bit. Uh, um, I don't know. That's <laughs> scary. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, 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 it could be somebody pretending to be related. <laughs> I'll send you the links later on. You can have a look yes, at it. Yes, definitely. Let me have a look at that. Certainly, it's not my father's uh, spirit. <laughs> right, but, it, but uh, like, like you, it's somebody who knows English and Spanish and Korean uh, and, and writes in all those oh, three languages. Oh, writes in Korean as well? Yeah, they have a Twitter account in Korean and they have a Twitter account in English. 
Oh, yeah. but it's not me. No, but it's very, very unusual, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> that's um, a surprise for you. Yeah, very. Su- I'm surprised. I would like to please do send me I the will, link. I'll definitely send that to you. Yes, yeah. yes, I'm surprised. Okay, so uh, listeners, if you are on Twitter, that's not Monica. Um, <laughs> maybe one day you will join Twitter, but you're not there yet. Uh, not yet, but I will I will get there. Okay. Twitter uh, and then uh, YouTube and uh-huh. what else, uh, all kind of… Um, They've got a thing called Instagram now. I think it's for sharing photos. I don't really so know it. Oh, yeah. I, I'm quite uh, sharing photos. Uh, I might not be in, inter- in Instagram because I am quite. Uh, I like to keep it private. Right. <laughs> well, we wish you uh, good luck with your book next Thank year, you. and also uh, good luck with visiting North Korea again uh, when that's open in future. Yeah, if I get a chance, yes, I would like to visit my friends there. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you once again for coming on the NK News podcast today, Monica Macias. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our podcast today. If you already have an NK News subscription, take a look at our NK Pro platform, which offers unparalleled services and lots of data to explore, specifically catering to the needs of professionals who need to monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access and a free trial membership by writing an email to membership at nknews.org. Uh, Also, if you have any feedback, questions or guest recommendations, please send them to podcast at nknews.org. Our thanks, as always, go to Brian Betts and Arias Dare for facilitating this episode and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thank you and listen again next time. (laughs) 